This is the day which the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. I hate to interrupt a good, happy conversation among Presbyterians. Um, but we're glad you're here as we worship God together today. I hope all of you will sign the friendship sheet as it uh, makes its way back and forth along the pew so we can have a record of you being here with us today, but uh, at least as important. If you don't know the folks sitting alongside you down your uh, row, this will give you a chance to take a look at that sheet and then greet one another uh, by name following the service today. We are grateful to have Kathy Hopkins here uh, singing a solo for us to enrich our worship this morning. Uh, grateful, as I mentioned at the early service, this is one of my favorite arrangements of a favorite psalm, and so I uh, uh, know that uh, you'll enjoy it and uh, our worship will be enhanced. As you look at the back of the bulletin, you see um, the various announcements, going, things going on. In the, oh, I also need to mention that uh, Meredith Covington Clayton is our fill-in uh, uh, choir director today. She needs no introduction, but it's always glad to have her. Um, when Dad needs to be gone, what a wonderful substitute we have. And so, Meredith, we're glad you're here. The back of the bulletin is a fairly typical week this week. Hope you'll be involved as you are able in the various uh, things going on in the life of the church. Uh, this week is a week that some of us have uh, uh, dreaded a little bit in that our parking lot, the main parking lot, will be torn up a good bit this week. Uh, maybe all week, so that really the only way to get into the stock building for most of this week will be through the Hargett Street entrance, which is in our outreach center, and really the only way to get into this building for much of the week will be through the Salisbury Street entrance. Um, if you have church business to conduct this week, it might be good to think if you can do it by phone. Uh, <laughs> Just because, but we will have our regular things. We'll have early birds. We'll have our Wednesday noon luncheon. Uh, but it's just, it'll be kind of hard to navigate around here. And we hope this will be the only week like this. Uh, we hope they can do what they need to do in the parking lot uh, and then cover it up and we'll be done with it. Next Sunday should be fine. It, it'll either be repaired or we'll have uh, plates over uh, where the trench is. And so next Sunday, should be fine, at least that's what we've been told, right? We're counting on that. Uh, but this week will be a little bit of a problem. We'd love to see you, uh, and, but call before you come if you're going to come, and we'll tell you whether there's a parking place for you. That's probably a word to the wise. Uh, our FPC shares item this month is your choice. Uh, whatever your favorite non-perishable food item is, we assume it will also appeal to other people and the folks that depend on our food pantries. Uh, so we encourage you to be generous as you support this uh, very hands-on project within the life of the church. I mentioned, uh, I left it over here again. The, the, uh, we've got a couple studies going to get, a couple studies will take place uh, as the fall gets underway. One is we are going to be offering a Disciple One Bible study class. We've tried to do that just about every year for the last several years. This year's Disciple One class will be on Monday evenings beginning the 12th of September. And it, you may be familiar with the Disciple program. It, it runs for uh, 34 weeks. It's a wonderful survey of Old Testament and New Testament. Uh, Jim and Dixie Crew and Freddie Crisp are going to be uh, team teaching that. Uh, it's going to be a lot of conversation. It's not real, really a lecture style, but engaged uh, conversation around the readings for the week. Uh, I, I, I encourage everybody, to, if they can, to be a part of a disciple class. And this disciple one is obviously how to begin. And so if, if, you're, if you'd like to know more about this class, you can give us a call in the church office or be in touch with one of these teachers, again, uh, Jim and Dixie Crew or Fred Crisp, uh, about the plans for this. But it's a, uh, a really a great program, and we've got lots of folks who've been through it and I think can uh, testify to it, uh, how good and effective it is. A shorter term course this fall for about eight weeks will be a, a study that I'll be doing on Tuesday evenings around a book called The Story of God, The Story of Us, which is actually a, an encapsulated version of the Old and New Testaments, but on a shorter time frame. 
Um, there'll be more information about this in the first press this week, so I won't go into a lot of that tonight, but it'll involve showing you how to get a book and that sort of thing. And that'll be, uh, begin uh, actually late this month, but really the, the bulk of the class will begin in September. But again, we're glad you're here with us as we worship God together. I invite you to use the time of the prelude to continue preparing yourself for this time of worship. Let us call ourselves to worship with words which often open our worship service. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. The Lord is my strength and my might. The Lord has become my salvation. Give thanks to the Lord, whose steadfast love endures forever.
in the sixth chapter of Isaiah's prophecy, before Isaiah is a prophet, he finds himself in the temple for worship and all of a sudden becomes aware of the presence of God, perhaps for the first time. And the prayer he blurts out is this, Woe is me, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell among a people of unclean lips. This was his way of saying that having found himself in the presence of God, he had no business being there because he was a sinner, a flawed and failed human being. He expected God to do him in. But instead, God made provision for his healing, his cleansing, made him a useful servant to serve his purpose. Through Jesus Christ, God has made provision for our healing, our cleansing, our redeeming, that we might be useful to God, to serve God's purpose. Trusting in that mercy, let us join together in the prayer of confession. Dear Lord, you have blessed us with families, but when was the last time we really talked and listened to each other? When did we show love for each other? We are part of the family of humankind. Yet when was the last time we spoke up or lifted a hand to address some injustice or cruelty? When did we do the loving thing? Lord, forgive us our callousness, our laziness, our self-concern. Remind us we are blessed to live in your kingdom and we have love to share. The God we know in Jesus Christ is a God who is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. The God we know in Christ has heard our confession and forgiven our sin. This is the heart of the gospel. Thanks be to God.
my stay. One word of your supporting breath drives all my fears away. This time, I would like to introduce to you a young lady who met with the session just moments ago. Colleen, if you would come forward at this time. Colleen McNamara. She's been a traveling girl all her life as a child and as an adult. Uh, she grew up in Richmond, worked a couple of years in D.C., but the past nine years has been all North Carolina. She graduated from UNCG and then got a master's in health administration from UNC Charlotte. And she's with United Healthcare in network management. Uh, her mother Geraldine, Father Gary, and her sister Bevan are all here. And if those names didn't tip you off, there's a lot of Irish in this McNamara band here. <clears throat> when an adult professes her faith, she may then be baptized as an adult member of the church. Baptism, the sign of God's redeeming grace, calls the new disciple to repentance, faithfulship, and to discipleship. Within this covenant of faith, God gives us new life, guards us from evil, and nurtures us in love. In embracing the covenant, we choose whom we will serve by turning from evil and turning to Jesus Christ. And whether it's an adult or a child, the congregation pledges to nurture the baptizee in her journey of faith. Colleen, I would now ask you to respond to the questions adults are asked at the time of their baptism. Trusting in the gracious mercy of God, do you turn from the ways of sin and renounce evil and its power in the world? Do you turn to Jesus Christ and accept him as your Lord and Savior, trusting in his grace and love? And will you be Christ's faithful disciple, obeying his word and showing his love? Would you please join me in a time of prayer? We thank you again, O oh God, for the water of baptism. In it, we are buried with Christ in his death. From it, we are raised to share in his resurrection. And through it, we are reborn by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. 
What is your full Christian name? Colleen Kendra McNamara. Colleen Kendra McNamara. I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Marked as one of Christ's own. I will ask Colleen to stay after the service, to stand down front so that you can greet her and officially welcome her, as now that she's been officially received by the session and is an, our newest official member, standing with her as her elder, Bradley Kramer. And let us close with prayer. Merciful God, you call us by name. Please watch over your servant, Colleen. We're thankful that in all her travels, she never wandered away from you. Continue to deepen her understanding of the gospel. Keep her in the faith and communion of her new home church. Increase her compassion for others. And send her into the world in witness to your love. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior of us all. Amen. Congratulations. Can you a napkin? Well, certainly a time of joys and concerns, Colleen. That's a joy to uh, be a part of uh, this stage in your faith journey, and we look forward to it continuing to bear fruit in and among us. We've had some folks uh, in and out of hospitals this week. Mary Bate Sherwood had some surgery on her foot and is now uh, doing some rehab, but doing well. Just learned that Patch Perry went into the hospital uh, yesterday and uh, for some uh, heart irregularities, and she's uh, staying in for uh, observation. Duncan Ray's brother, Charlie's, had a couple surgical procedures uh, over the last week or so, and that family uh, invites uh, your prayers, and so hope you'll surround him and be with the Ray family. Some of the ongoing prayer concerns among us, this could be a pretty long list, but just highlight a couple. Martha Dale Stock continues to be in need of our prayers, and of course, Ed, too. Um, Marion Ross, who has uh, some... Uh, plagued with some difficulty in breathing, but actually had a fall this past week, and so keep uh, Marion and her family in your prayers. Last week, I think uh, Bob mentioned that a former associate pastor here, uh, who was here during Ed Stock's ministry, Donna Harder, was critically ill. She actually died this week, um, really uh, came as a shock to us. Her service was yesterday in Austin, Texas, uh, and uh, so we know you'll want to uh, know about that so you can be in prayer for her family and loved ones. Of course, what's been on most of our minds this week is the death of Dr. Al Edwards, uh, the longest serving pastor of First Presbyterian Church, served here from 1958 to 1986. Such a wonderful legacy. Uh, the service here was Thursday afternoon and uh, the burial was Friday afternoon in a perfectly beautiful historic family cemetery in Virginia where if the clouds are uh, cleared, you can see the mountains in a, in a place near uh, Margaret's uh, home place. Um, in addition to the family being there, this is a testament really to Dr. Al's ministry. There was at least one man who came to the graveside who I think was a teenager or a young adult at one of Dr. Al's first churches. Uh, now, uh, I'm not good with ages, but I would say he was well into his 70s, but learned about uh, Dr. Al's death and the, the burial, and he was there and came and spoke to me right before the service, and I quote what he said, he could sure preach a sermon. Um, <laughs> if there's, uh, um, that, that, is, that is a powerful witness um, to the impact a preacher, we're talking about 50 or 60 years ago made on a young person's life who's now somewhat seasoned in life but wanted to be there on the day um, uh, for Dr. Edwards' committal. So uh, uh, a wonderful testimony to a life well lived and a church well served. Let us now uh, join together in a time of prayer. Let us pray. Eternal God, we've already been reminded that you are gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. We lift our hearts to you this day, grateful for that. 
grateful for your covenant promises, for your daily providence, grateful that we don't belong to ourselves, but to you. Gracious God in Christ, you have shown us the depth and breadth of your love, which allows us to live our lives in joyful confidence, knowing that nothing can separate us from you that even in our failure to perfectly follow you or to worthily praise you, you are for us Heavenly Father, who seeks us, saves us, redeems us, and restores us. And because we need such seeking and restoration, today we give you our thanks and praise. Lord God, you know our needs before we utter them. You know the deepest anxieties of our hearts even before we give them voice. And so we come before you this day not with a list of wants or needs. Instead, we come before you as empty vessels. Yearning to be filled by your grace and your goodness, we come before you as fearful travelers seeking your guiding hand upon our lives. You already know our needs, O oh God. And so we simply place ourselves and our lives before you, and we yield ourselves and our loved ones to your perfect will, trusting that you are with us and for us, and that by your grace we have nothing to fear. Gracious God, open our eyes to your remarkable generosity, that we might learn to be generous ourselves. With all that we have and all that we are is a result of your divine favor. Teach us the joy of sacrificial living. Teach us the joy of reckless love. The joy of trusting ourselves to you. To live lives of holy extravagance. As we seek to reflect the extravagance we have seen in you and in your son Jesus Christ. Lord God, bless us as we seek to be your faithful people. Give us a sense of urgency about what it means to be your people in this place at this moment, that we might live faithfully, that we might be responsive to your call, and find our true purpose in a life lived for you through Jesus Christ our Lord, who taught us when we prayed together to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I'd like to invite the children to come forward and join me up front. Good morning. How are you, Laura? Hi, Jane. Happy birthday. Hey, Anna Wesley. Hi, Allie. Come on, William. Hi, Caitlin. Hi, Allison, Annie, and Ben. All right. Oh, here comes one more. Back from vacation. Good morning. I'm so glad you guys came to listen to me this morning. I wanted to ask you if you knew what this was. Do you know what this is? Okay, if it's passed down the row, do you know what it's called? Yes? It's the offering plate, right? This is an example of an offering plate. Today I wanted to talk to you about that part of worship. After we hear the word read and then the word proclaimed in the sermon, we respond to what we hear by giving something in honor to God. And we do that with money, and that's one way to do it. And so 
I encourage you to think with your family about ways that you can contribute to the offering. Now, what do you think these have to do with each other? <coughs> Very good. We are collecting wide mouth bottles, everybody. Vitamin bottles, Gatorade bottles. I still need about 50. Um, and we're going to use these. We're going to put special stickers on them, and you're going to take these home. And this is where you're going to collect money. And we're going to track how much money you guys are bringing. And so we can see how much the children are bringing to the church. And rejoice in all that you have to give. You can um, talk to your parents about money. You can use some of your allowance. Alex, uh, my son, he gets an allowance and he gives 10% into his church fund. So he'll bring that and put it in his. And then we will have times that we will collect these once a month and you can bring them in to your classroom or you can bring it into uh, before you come into worship and we'll collect that money and rejoice in all that God has given us and give back to the church and, its, and God's people. Let's have a prayer. Dear God, thank you for all you have given us we respond with great joy and give to you a portion of our money and all of ourselves. In Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. Thank you. You may go back to your seats. Let us pray for illumination. Lord, open our hearts and minds to the power of your Holy Spirit, so that we, we may hear with joy what you have to say to us today. Amen. Our first reading is from Genesis chapter 37, verses 2 through 8. This is the story of the family of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was shepherding the flock with his brothers. He was a helper to the sons of Bilhah and Zilpah, his father's wives. And Joseph brought a bad report of them to his, their father. Now Israel loved Joseph more than any of his other children, because he was the son of his old age, and he had made him a long robe with sleeves. But when his brothers saw their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peaceably to him. Once Joseph had a dream, and when he told it to his brothers, they hated him even more. He said to them, listen to this dream that I dreamed. There we were, binding sheaves in the field. Suddenly, my sheaf rose and stood upright. Then your sheaves gathered around it and bowed down to my sheaf. His brothers said to him, are you indeed to reign over us? Are you indeed to have dominion over us? So they hated him even more because of his dreams and his words. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. It's a blessing to have uh, Sarah with us today because her father's off preaching to Presbyterians elsewhere. Um, so uh, it's good to have her uh, reading scripture. Um, in regard to Sarah's uh, lesson on uh, the offering, uh, after Dr. Al's service Thursday, someone came out and said, I'll always remember Dr. Al saying when he called for the offering, the Lord loves a cheerful giver. He also likes a grumpy one. You know, so. <laughs> Good to have his granddaughters with us today. Our scripture readings are, uh, are kind of unusual today. If, are you one of those people when you get a novel, you read the last chapter first, see how it comes out? Um, it's kind of what I'm doing with this. Uh, Sarah read the, the story about Joseph and why his brothers hate him. And uh, in between, in the sermon, I'll give you sort of the condensed version of what happened in between that. And here, when they have come to Joseph, whom they don't recognize, uh, who's the one handing out all the food in Egypt. 
So this is kind of the, getting near the end of the Joseph saga with Genesis uh, chapter 45. I'm reading from uh, this fairly new translation, the Common English Bible. Joseph could no longer control himself in front of all his attendants, so he declared, everyone leave now. So no one stayed with him when he revealed his identity to his brothers. He wept so loudly that the Egyptians and Pharaoh's household heard him. And Joseph said to his brothers, I'm Joseph. Is my father really still alive? His brothers couldn't respond because they were terrified before him. Joseph said to his brothers, come closer to me. And they moved closer. He said, I'm your brother, Joseph, the one you sold to Egypt. Now, don't be upset. Don't be angry with yourselves that you sold me here. Actually, God sent me before you to save lives. We've already had two years of famine in the land, and there are five years left without planting or harvesting. God sent me before you to make sure you'd survive and to rescue your lives in this amazing way. You didn't send me here. It was God who made me a father to Pharaoh, master of his entire household, and ruler of the whole land of Egypt. Hurry, go back to your father. Tell him this is what your son Joseph says. God has made me master of all of Egypt. Come down to me. Don't delay. You may live in the land of Goshen. So you will be near me, your children, your grandchildren, your flocks, your herds, and everyone with you. I will support you there, so you, your household, and everyone with you won't starve, since the famine will last another five years. You and my brother Benjamin have seen with your own eyes that I'm speaking to you. Tell my father about my power in Egypt and about everything you've seen. Hurry and bring my father down here. He threw his arms around his brother Benjamin's neck and wept, and Benjamin wept on his shoulder. He kissed all of his brothers and wept, embracing them. After that, his brothers were finally able to talk to him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. <clears throat> long, long ago, our family had one TV. One black and white TV, a Sylvania, with the halo light. I don't know if that halo light was part of my spiritual journey or not, but one of the shows I liked watching on that TV was the Donna Reed show. And I remember thinking when I was about 12 or 13, gee, I wish my mother was like that. <laughs> Donna never yelled at anybody. She was always nice. I like the Donna Reed show, not just because of Shelley Fabre. Uh, there was another show, um, Father Knows Best. Another sweet mom, Jane Wyatt, played Margaret Anderson. TV was populated with nice moms. Leave it to Beaver, Ozzie and Harriet. I somehow missed out on the Brady Bunch, but I'm told that was a very nice blended family. But you're saying, Bob, those were fictional. Uh, nobody's real family is like that. Well... I've known a few real life families where mutual love and respect make for a pretty healthy family. But you're right, I imagine most of us are somewhere between father knows best and those families who expose themselves on the Jerry Springer show. <laughs> we don't take a course on how to be family. The only instruction we get in parenting is what we experience with our own parents, and so we muddle through. Maybe if things get real uncomfortable, we seek some outside help from counselors. And if it's any consolation, a counselor I asked about this said that there has to be a certain amount of discomfort for the kids to want to leave home, set out on their own. She said, and I quote, the typical adolescent response, response of finding parents offensive is almost necessary for the differentiation process differentiation is coming to see yourself as you really are, uh, not simply son of or little boy or, or seeing yourself defined by some role that uh, you may have been given along the way, troublemaker, loser, klutz. Maybe this is one reason some of these Bible stories just leap off the page at us. They're real folks, not perfect families. Last month I went through the family of Jacob. How mom helped the son deceive the father to abscond with the brother's blessing, and then the angry brother vows to kill the little brother who stole his blessing. God's people. 
Well, today's story continues with the next generation of that family, Jacob's 12 sons, including the most favored one, Joseph. If I were trying to win converts to the faith, I think I would look for our best and brightest, the, the heroes who did great things, not the, the ones who come across as petty and selfish, like us. But perhaps the Bible's message is that God's will will be done through regular, flawed people just like us. who mess up regularly, do ungodlike things at times. God will prevail. And perhaps God can do something great through you. But before I start on the brother nobody liked except dad, let me mention an extreme. This book was an eye-opener for me when I was in seminary. It came out in the late 80s. Toxic Parents by Susan Forward. Despite all the messages in the world that you should love your parents, your mother and your father, there are some parents who for whatever reason, be it mental illness, addiction, or just plain meanness, are toxic. It's probably best to just keep some distance. If this parent never lets up telling you you're unlovable, no good, a loser, a disgrace to the family, whatever the negative message is, sometimes it's hard to defend yourself against that. You may know you're a pretty good person, but sometimes the parent has this secret weapon that gets through your defenses, through your psyche, and you're back to being a little kid again, hearing from an authority figure that you're not okay. Sometimes the only way to unhook from that is to put some distance between you and the one who is toxic. I have some personal experience with this phenomenon, but I have seen adults intelligent, gifted, lovable people, nice people, who are held back by some persistent message that tells them they are not okay, they're never going to be loved, wanted, useful, whatever. If any of that sounds familiar, you might want to see a counselor just to get her insight into how well you've differentiated. If you've matured into your own identity, a fully functioning human being, a child of God. Otherwise, you can spend the rest of your life not being able to have a healthy relationship or to leave an unhealthy relationship or to make other necessary critical decisions. You're trapped. Now, <clears throat> let me say I didn't prepare this sermon in response to any particular situation except the situation we find in this complicated biblical family and the biblical character Jacob. Remember, Jacob was a trickster. But Laban, the father of the lovely Rachel, he was a trickster too. So the first wife he gave Jacob was Leah. Eventually, the lovely Rachel became his wife, but she was unable to give him children. And so in the custom of the day, she loaned him her servant Bilhah so that he could father some children through her. So we have a very blended family here. Two legal wives, Leah and Rachel, and then some brothers whose father was Jacob, but whose mother wasn't Leah or Rachel. Since Joseph was the firstborn, of the lovely Rachel, he was the favored one, by far. Not fair, but it's a fact. And when Rachel's second son was born and she died in childbirth, Benjamin became the second favorite. Everybody knows that. So we pick up the story in chapter 37 of Genesis. Joseph is now 17. There's another reason not to like him. <clears throat> it says he was helping his older brothers, half-brothers technically, with the shepherding duties. Out there in the field, Joseph is probably wearing his special robe. Now, the Hebrew is kind of hard to translate it, but in the very least, it's some kind of regal robe with long sleeves. Only Joseph got one. Today, Joseph would be the one with the North Face jacket while the other brothers got brand X from the thrift store. You know. That's one reason they hate him. He's the chosen one, and he doesn't hide it. And now it gives him another reason to hate him. He comes back home and tells Dad... The brothers aren't doing such a great job with the sheep, the little twerp. And now number three reason to hate Joseph, he's the dreamer. He has a dream. Now in the Bible, dreams are ways of God, that God has of speaking to people, dreams and visions. And little Joe has no reservation whatsoever about sharing his dream with his brothers. He says, listen to this dream I dreamed. We were binding sheaves in the field, and suddenly my sheaf rose and stood upright, and your sheaves gathered around it and bowed down to my sheaf. Bowed down as to the king? So the brothers respond with a sneer, Ah, oh, you're going to reign over us? 
And in the words of scripture, it says, so they hated him even more because of his dreams and his words. And then he has a second dream about the whole family bowing down to him. And the story concludes with this verse, so his brothers were jealous of him. But his father kept this matter in mind. Hmm, there may be something to these dreams. Stay tuned. But perhaps ignoring the brother's disdain for Joseph, Father Jacob blithely sends him out into the field again to go check on those brothers and come back with a report on how they're doing. One of the brothers spots Joseph coming from a distance and he says, look, here comes the dreamer. I got an idea. Let's just kill him. And the rest of them say, okay, we're good with that. Yeah. <clears throat> one of them says, I can't stomach hearing any more of his egotistical dreams. Let's just kill a little rat and toss him in one of these big old holes out here, these cisterns, and, uh, and then we won't have to listen to any more of his mess. Now, the oldest brother, Reuben, intercedes, perhaps mindful of the Jewish respect for life and disdain for blood. Reuben speaks up and says, let's shed no blood. Don't lay hands on him. Now, apparently, Reuben is thinking they're going to toss Jake, uh, Joseph in one of these holes out here, and then he can come back later and, and rescue the little snot. Maybe he'll be humbled by all this. But mob rule prevails. The other brothers grab Joseph, rip that royal robe right off his body, and toss him in a pit. The pit was empty. No water in it. No water, no food. They're going to leave him there. You don't have to be a rabbi to figure out what's going to happen to Joseph. The boys all sit down and eat lunch. Joseph is in the pit, starving with no water, and they're over there merrily chomping away on goat barbecue. Yeah. And they see coming over the horizon this caravan of traders headed toward Egypt with a bunch of stuff. And one of the mercenary brothers says, yeah, there's no profit in killing Joseph, but we can make a little money by selling him to these uh, foreigners. So they do. Just to cover their tracks, they take that robe of his that they already ripped off of him, dip it in goat's blood, and concoct a story for Dad that wild animals tore Joseph apart. Here's the bloody proof. He is dead, dead, dead. Father Jacob is distraught and refuses to be comforted at the death of his most favorite son. The Reader's Digest version of the next few chapters is that Joseph is put to work in Egypt, first as a butler in the house of somebody who works for the Pharaoh, and, then, and everything he does, he does well. God blesses everything Joseph does. He shows good character, leadership skills, and eventually this ability to interpret dreams because God tells him what the dreams are saying. And then he interprets the Pharaoh's dream, the one about the seven-year famine that's on the way. So the Pharaoh puts Joseph in charge of this mammoth project of storing up all the grain and then eventually dispensing it. So here we have Joseph being held in highest esteem by the king of Egypt and God blessing everything he does. And meanwhile, back in Canaan, Jacob looks at his boy and says, why are you all sitting here looking at each other when we're starving to death? I hear there's food up in Egypt. Why don't you all get up there and buy some? Aha. So now we're set for payback. The brothers who attempted to kill Joseph will now find themselves at his mercy if they want food. Joseph is now 30, and he's moved with compassion when he sees his brothers, although they don't recognize him. By this time, he knows that God's been working out God's plan in all this, and had he not ended up in Egypt, uh, despite all their shenanigans, they'd all be starving to death. Since they don't recognize him, he messes with them a little bit, but eventually they get food. And then they come back with Dad and little Ben, and the whole family is together again in Egypt. And the story concludes with Joseph saying to his brothers, Even though you intended to do harm to me, God intended it for good, in order to preserve a numerous people, as he is doing today. And it says in this way, he reassured them, speaking kindly to them. Grace abounds. Some scholars think that one way this story spoke to the Jews is if Joseph was the favored one, the chosen one, how should they live as God's chosen people? How should they handle their chosenness? And one question it might raise across the generations and speak to us is how do we treat dreamers? Sarah's daddy, Dr. Paul Rowland, has a knack for finding amazing facts, and he shared this quote with me this week. A verse from this Genesis story is on a plaque on the balcony of the Lorraine Motel in Memphis. 
where Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was killed April 4th, 1968. The inscription reads, here comes the dreamer. Come now, let us kill him and we shall see what will become of his dreams. <coughs> Maybe the story of Joseph and his brothers spoke to you in a very real way. Maybe you come from a family where they were favorites, or they were black sheep, or maybe your beloved mother was absent, or your father was unable to give you much attention. Maybe there was dysfunction in your family. Dysfunction can take the form of abandonment, addictions, anger, blaming, controlling, criticizing, demanding, devaluing, disapproval, disowning, and I'll stop just four letters into the alphabet. <clears throat> Does such a background shackle you for life? Is it your alibi for failure, for failing to achieve your full human self? Or could you go on to become, oh, let's say, President of the United States? Newsweek recently ran articles on the parents of Barack Obama, and they could be poster children for dysfunction. Let me interject here. Please do not stop up your ears. Um, I know that some of you judge any reference to any elected official to be an endorsement. And I realize whether the president is Obama or Bush, some of you think he's wonderful and some of you think he's terrible. Informed opinions are wonderful. But what I'm going to give you now is simply biographical information gleaned from two articles in Newsweek magazine. Who was the president's father? Barack Hussein Obama Sr. was, and I quote, an unmitigated jerk, a coxcombish souse who forced friends to cover his abundant bar tabs and repeatedly broke his legs in boozy car crashes, promptly fired from or sidelined at every job he ever had, a compulsive philanderer. He was brilliant, but he was an egomaniac. The president's mother was named Shirley by her parents, eventually adopting her middle name. She went by Ann Dunham, later taking the name of her second husband. She had a deep spiritual streak, although she was never part of a church. Um, she too was smart, trying to go to grad school while raising children on her own. When he was nine, she sent little Barack back to Hawaii, where he was happy to be raised by grandparents. And she would go pursue, pursue her career all around the world. She was a free spirit probably not parent material. To say young Barack grew up in a world of disorder is accurate. Newsweek mentioned when he met Michelle, her family seemed like leave it to beaver, domestic bliss. It stirred in him what he said was a longing for stability and a sense of place I had not realized was there. Can you break free from a world of dysfunction? The biographer of President Obama's father, Sally Jacobs, concluded, and again I'm quoting, unlike his father, the president is a committed family man who rarely drinks, who never loses his cool, who values pragmatism over idealism, who prefers consensus to conflict, and who has mastered the art of working within the system. It would be simplistic to suggest that his temperament is somehow a reaction to the excesses of a father he never really knew, but it throws into sharp relief the traits that make America's current president so exceptional." End quote. I guess some cynics would say if Barack Obama's father, Barack Sr., was a drunk and a philanderer, he too could have been president. But, uh, <clears throat> but I think this illustrates how we may be scarred by things from our past, but we're not doomed by them. In this case, it seems as if the son intentionally chose to go the other way. He pursued academics, but with a purpose. And he came alive when he was drawn to a healthy family that valued each other. So he tried to emulate the good values and leave behind the bad examples. Well, back to the Bible and Joseph. I would think that if your own brothers, the people you lived with, hated you, made fun of you, hated to see you coming, and then plotted to kill you and actually left you for dead, I would think that would leave a lasting scar. And I, 
would think it would have just torn your heart apart to know that your loving father thinks that you are dead. And here you are in a totally foreign land, learning a new language, a whole new way of life, a land where your religion, which is vital to who you are, is foreign to them. Is there any hope for you? Is God still with you? Yes. And maybe God is using you to save the world. Perhaps the message of the Joseph story is choose which voices you'll listen to. The negative ones, which tell you you're no good, or the voice of God, which says, I love you, and I have something for you to do, something that's very important, and I will be with you wherever you go, and I want you to be well. One of the ways for keeping our affirmations of faith from being rote declarations is to change the words from time to time. Today we will use the ecumenical version of the Apostles' Creed, which is found on page 14 in the front part of your hymn book, just under the traditional one that we typically use. Using this ecumenical version, which is just slightly different, let us say what we believe. I believe in God, the Father Almighty creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. We serve a generous God, a gracious God. Let us offer ourselves to that God as we bring God's tithes and our offerings.
Let us pray. Lord God of grace, like Joseph, you have blessed us beyond measure. We have certainly felt your favor. But help us, like Joseph, to discover that you bless us not for our own sakes, but for the sake of the world. Expand our vision, broaden our reach, so that your love can be at work through us as we dedicate ourselves and our offerings to you, now and forevermore, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. I'd remind you of two things. One, to uh, welcome Colleen as our newest member to the church following the service. Secondly, to remember the words that God spoke to Joshua. Be strong, be courageous. I will be with you wherever you go. God was certainly with Dr. Edwards wherever he went, and at his service Thursday we concluded with a benediction that Susan had uh, saved. It was one that her dad, Bert, she called him, had, had written back in 1986. And she saved this from a worship service here. And many of you have heard him do a version uh, of this benediction. So here now, uh, the words of Dr. Al, speaking on behalf of his Lord and Savior. May the courage of the early morning's dawning and the strength of God's majestic hills and the peace and quiet of an evening's ending and the hope and joy of another tomorrow to come. Be your God-given possessions and gifts, now and always. Amen. 